Have you ever wondered how to build an amazing volunteer farm event at your farm for your CSA members? This past weekend, we threw together a garlic scaping volunteer day for our CSA members in about four hours. And we had 20 people show up and they helped us knock it out of the park in about three hours. It was incredible. So this podcast episode is going to break down the best practices for how to make sure your volunteer days are awesome. Let's get started. Hey there, this is Corinna Bench and welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more confident at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Well, welcome to episode 114 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I'm your host, Corinna Bench from Shared Legacy Farms CSA out in Elmer, Ohio. I'm also the founder of MyDigitalFarmer.com, which is all about trying to help other farmers get more confident and polished in their messaging and marketing so you can grow your business online. Welcome back to the show if you are here for the first time. A special welcome to you. I hope you enjoy this episode. Please consider subscribing to my podcast if you enjoy what you hear today. And I encourage you to go check out the first 10 episodes of this podcast. Although they were recorded over a year ago now, I designed them to be kind of like the fundamentals of marketing. So if you're just beginning to listen to me and you need some instruction in Marketing 101, that's a great place to start. For all of my regular listeners, welcome back to the show. I am recording this in the middle of June, and we just harvested our garlic scapes last week, and that is actually the impetus for today's topic. We are going to talk about how to set up a really great volunteer experience for your customers if you want to invite them out onto the farm to help volunteer with you. What can you do to make sure they have a great experience? What are some best practices? We use volunteers a lot from our CSA membership, and so I felt like this was a perfect topic to bring up in this week's episode because some of you might be using volunteers sometime this summer. So the reason this topic came to mind is because A few days ago, Kurt came into the house and was kind of giving me the play-by-play of what he was going to be working on the next day with the crew, and he sounded a little stressed out. He said, well, we've got to harvest the scapes, and it's going to take quite a while, and I've only got this many people helping me, but we got to get it done, et cetera, et cetera. And I could tell that he probably wasn't going to get the job done with that number of people. And so I just said, whoa, 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 hold on one second. Why don't we try and get some volunteers to come out and help? Because... Cutting garlic scapes is not that hard to do. I mean, it's kitchen shears, and it's actually kind of fun. He hadn't even considered it, though, because it was very last minute, right? Like, he decided we needed to cut the garlic scapes, and I would literally have to let my CSA members know that day because we were going to harvest them the next morning. And I'm like, well, let me just put a call out into our Facebook group, and we'll see what happens. We'll just see if people show up. If they don't show up, they don't show up. And you just try and get done what you can get done. But if they do show up, then you'll have, you know, an extra, even an extra two or three hands will go a long way. You'll get a little bit more done than you had planned. So he's like, go for it, try it. So that's what I did. I hopped into my Facebook group. I didn't even send an email out. I hopped into the Facebook group and we did a live video and we explained, hey, we've decided we need to cut the garlic scapes. We're super excited. The garlic scapes are ready. You're going to have them in your box next week. Um, If you want to come out and help us cut them, it's really fun. Uh, Give us an hour of your time. Bring some kitchen shears and be here sometime between 9 and noon. We're going to have a blast. And there's free garlic scapes in it for you. I mean, that was kind of the offer. That was the pitch. And there were so many people who got really excited about the fact that we were going to have garlic scapes because this is kind of a legend in our CSA every year. And we saw one by one, we saw people starting to comment on the post. I'm going to be there. I'll be there. I'll be there. And we ended up having, um, I want to say we had 15 people show up during that three hour period the next day to help us. And guess what? We got the garlic scapes harvested in 
two and a half hours, which was incredible. They, we were done by 1130 in the morning. And we had planned to, <laughs> to be going quite a bit longer if no one else had shown up. So it was a huge success. And not only that, there were, there were a lot of people that came. So there was a lot of energy. There was a lot of excitement. And it boosted the morale of our paid crew that was out there because they were getting to rub shoulders with the actual customers and get to see how excited they were. Plus, they were seeing the process of harvesting move so much faster. And that's always motivating, right? So I wanted to talk about, kind of wanted to break down what exactly happened there as we threw together that volunteer experience, because we do this a lot. We have a lot of spontaneous volunteer events that we offer to our CSA members, but sometimes we actually plan them well in advance. We know that we want to invite members to do a certain job when the task finally comes into the schedule. And I thought it would be helpful for some of you to just listen to some tips for how to put together a great volunteer event. And I have sketched out some ideas here on my notes seven best practices or seven kind of rules to follow if you want to make sure that your volunteers have a good experience. And I want you to remember that when your customer is coming out to the farm to help you volunteer, they, they're functioning as a volunteer, but they're still a customer. And this is an opportunity for you to deeply connect with them in a very unique way because they're actually coming onto your property. They're seeing the farm, all of these expectations all of this living vicariously through the farmer, all that stuff, that nostalgia is coming out inside of them, right? While they're on your property. And so this is a customer service moment. Even though they're helping you, you're actually providing a service to them because deep down, many of them actually want this kind of experience. You're actually giving them a gift, giving them something very powerful by allowing them to come onto your farm. I've actually noticed that if people come and visit my farm, For any reason, whether it's the pickup site at the farm itself, or if they come to a farm day event, or if they come to volunteer on the farm, those people tend to have a much higher retention in general. And the volunteers that come back consistently consistently again and again, my volunteers are my deeply invested customers. They are the ones that are really bought into the mission. So there is a lot of value behind creating a strategy that actually encourages your members to have the option to volunteer. And by doing so, you're, you're allowing people to kind of move more deeply into a relationship with you. And it can be a very powerful thing for them. You should probably have general liability insurance for this option. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know exactly what you need to carry, how much insurance you need to carry, but we do have this in our liability policy. We have talked to our insurance agent and we have told them, hey, we have farm days on the farm. We have volunteer days for our customers. And so there is something in our insurance policy in case something were to happen, okay? So I just wanna mention that's something you should look into if you're going to be doing this. Now, we also have a section in our CSA handbook that um, talks about things like, Um, the fact that we have electric fences around our chickens, right? That we have a dog on the farm. If you're going to come visit the farm, hey, watch out for X, Y, Z. Please be careful when um, supervision of children. Like we have all these little paragraphs about what happens if you come to visit on the farm and some of the things they need to know. And I think that that's also a good practice to have in place somewhere in your policies and procedures Somewhere where people can go and see, when I come to the farm, these are the things that I need to know about. These are the policies I need to abide by. And if you want to see an example of our handbook and what exactly we put in there, you can you can get my template. Just go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash onboarding. Subscribe and it'll, it'll go into your inbox and you can look at it and just use that language to help guide your own version of that. So that's something you might want to consider. We also require our volunteers to do a couple of things when they show up. Um, We want them to wash their hands before they go out and work with produce um, in most cases, unless they're weeding or something. Um, And then we also require that they sign in. So we have a big whiteboard in our pack shed and they have to go and actually sign their name on it when they when they arrive and when they leave. And this is just something we can take a picture of then at the end of the event and put that into our documentation in case we need to show some of our certifiers like who exactly came to the farm and visited on what day. So that's a procedure that we also have in place. I don't know if you need to do that, but that's one of our procedures that I thought I would share with you. 
And finally, just ask yourself the question before I go through these best practices, before you begin to plan volunteer events, ask yourself the question, do I want kids to come? Or is this event that I'm planning kid friendly? Always a question that you should ask. Some of our volunteer events are not kid friendly and we're not afraid to just say that when we communicate it with our customers and, and invite them out. We just let them know that this event is for um, people 12 years and up or 16 years and up, or whatever. Um, or we say this is an adult only event. We use language like that to communicate that this is probably not something that a child should come and participate in. All right, so let's jump into my seven best practices. So as you're planning out, you're thinking about, I want to put a volunteer event together at my farm. What do I need to think about? The first thing I'm going to say is make sure you pick the right job for them to do. Okay, this is so, so important. And we have messed up on this in our early years. So something like garlic scape harvest, that's really hard to mess up. For a customer to come and hand them some kitchen shears and say, here is where you cut it on the scape, right? Here is where we're trimming, we're looping them on my fingers, and then after you get six, we're going to twist time together, right? Like that's a pretty easy ask. People can't really mess that up. The only way they can mess that up is they might miss a scape. They might just miss a, a plant entirely. So we try to find volunteer jobs that are fun and that are fairly easy for our customer to experience success because we want them to have fun and we want them to feel successful with this volunteer experience. The worst thing that could happen is that someone would come out all excited to be giving something back to you, right? And then they have the worst time ever or they feel like a failure or they mess up so badly that they're embarrassed and mortified. So we want to we don't want to put them in that position. So don't give them a job that's going to be really hard to do like harvesting carrots for instance. I would never give that job to a bunch of volunteers because there's too much room for error. Um, in fact, we did once and it was very it was a negative experience because we lost a lot of product. One of us got angry about it and our customer saw that. So choose the right kinds of jobs. So some of the things that we have done with great success here, um, garlic scaping, garlic harvest is also really fun. Just having people help uh, pull the, the garlic out of the ground, lay them on the trailers, bring them back in. Um, we've had people helping us crack the garlic or take the, the seed apart. I forget what that's called, but um, pulling out the different cloves. Um, we've had planting potatoes where we give everybody a piece of uh, a wood, like a, a certain distance apart, right? So the, the little kids are given this tiny piece of wood, almost like a ruler, and then there's a sack of potatoes and their parents are kind of following them along and they're using the ruler to measure the space between the potatoes and they're placing them down into the ground, okay? That's also very fun. I remember we did that a couple of different years. Asparagus planting, Again, pretty simple to just place the crowns in the ground. Um, pulling out the tomato steaks or cutting the tomato twine or pulling out the uh, plastic mulch from the fields at the end of the year. Like these tasks that are, um, you know, repetitive and kind of monotonous, but that can be done really quickly. If you have five people, you can knock it out in a couple hours. Those kinds of things are really easy to add onto the list. Um, so things that I wouldn't give away very easily. These are not the top of the things on my list. I don't like to ask my customers to weed for us because I feel like sometimes we've had customers accidentally pull out the plant, the vegetable plant, instead of the weed. They don't have uh, the ability to distinguish between what is a weed and what isn't a weed. So we've learned just not to put people into that position. Um, we've also made the mistake of giving um, a, a vol I remember one time we had a guy come out here. He was local. He wanted to just be outside and volunteer. And we gave him the job of weeding every single time he came for like an hour and a half. And he was coming twice a week. And it was a hard job. And you know what? He only lasted for like two, three weeks. And then he just stopped coming. And looking back on it now, I realized we gave him really boring repetitive job, it never changed. We never let him do something else. And after a while, like that's not feeding his soul anymore, right? So just be thinking about what is the right job? Think about who's coming. Do, do I have children coming? If I have kids coming, I need to have something that they can do where they feel like this is important and they're not gonna mess up on it. Okay, that's kind of tip number one. I spent a long time on that, but that's a really important one. Number two, 
is to give them a goal to define success. People need to know what does success look like for me for the time that I'm here? And there's many ways that you can do this. We actually do this with our paid staff too sometimes. You can tell them, okay, you guys need to um, do this many bed rows or you know, get all the way to the end of the bed or I need you to harvest this many, like give them a count. Or you can say, you need to work for one hour or one and a half hours. Or if you could give me two hours of your time and we all gave two hours of our time, we wouldn't get the job done, right? So set a goal to help them know how to pace themselves, but also to know when they can go home, right? Like when they're allowed to leave, because sometimes they get to the end of their hour and they're they're tired and they're hot and they're thirsty and it's there's no shade out there in the field and secretly they're like oh man I'm kind of done now but you know I, can I go yet and if you've given them permission like hey you're not going to finish the whole job in an hour that's okay I just need you to work for 1 hour and then you know here's what you get to do next you get to go back into the pack shed sit in the cooler for a little bit and enjoy an ice cream on us right? Like you want to make sure that they know this is how much time you're here. This is when you're done and tell them this is what success looks like for your shift. That is so, so important. So make sure that you define success before they arrive and communicate that to them. That's often a part of my pitch before they even come. If I'm going to promote this in an email or throw it out onto a Facebook live or in an Instagram story, I'm going to say things like, Hey, come to the farm from, we're going to be here from this time to this time, show up for one hour, give us one hour of your time, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like I'll say that in the pitch so they know what they're getting themselves into before they even say yes. Okay, tip number three is to train them exactly how to do the job. This is what great managers do as well. You don't want to assume that they know how to cut a garlic scape because even if they know what the scape is, which is perhaps unlikely, they're not going to know like how far down do I snip it, right? How many am I putting into a bunch? These are things that they don't know. So you literally need to explain it step by step. And I think it's helpful to have a paid staff person there or someone who's experienced, who's done it before, who can kind of be like the manager or the overseer of the volunteers that's working alongside them. And that way, There's somebody constantly keeping an eye on the progress and making sure that they're doing it correctly. So train them, show them how it's done, walk alongside them for a while. You'll probably have to correct them once or twice. Say, hey, don't, you know, don't forget you got to do this. Feel free to do that. They actually want that feedback because they want to do this right. They want to do this well. So tell them exactly how to do it, where to put the product, what not to do, et cetera, et cetera. All right, moving on to number four. This one is really important. You need to spend time with them and talk to them. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be there right next to them for the entire three hours of your volunteer event. I know that you're busy and the whole reason that you're inviting volunteers out here is so that you can multiply yourself and work on other things. That's what you should be doing. But just be aware that with a CSA member, one of the reasons that they've joined your CSA is that they want to get to know the farmer. They want to get to know you. And so when you invite them to your farm as the host of this event, they're kind of expecting you to be there for some of it. Maybe they're not expecting you to stand next to them for the entire time they're working, but they do expect you to make an appearance and talk with them for a little bit. Rub shoulders with them. Give them a chance to say, I got to meet my farmer. I got to talk to my farmer about my life a little bit. My farmer actually knows my name. I actually, he actually knows something about me. This is important and you don't want to miss this. So if you're going to have people coming in different shifts, then you need to plan on working with shift number one for 10, 15 minutes, chatting, moving around, talking to different people, and then you can go away and then come back for the end of that shift as you say goodbye. And then the next shift's coming in, you do another another greeting, another onboarding, same thing, right? So you can still move away in and out uh, just so they have a chance to get to know you a little bit. I want you to look at these events as an opportunity to deeply connect 
with some of your core customers, with people who are probably going to become your brand ambassadors. That's what volunteers often are eventually. So don't miss that opportunity. I want to read to you an email that I got from one of the volunteers the day after our garlic scaping event this past weekend, because it speaks perfectly to this point. This is from Katie, and she said, We had so much fun coming out to the farm today. As soon as we got home, the kids ran outside to start playing that they were working in their garden picking garlic and zucchini. Thank you for welcoming them, too, and for making an impression on them. They also absolutely loved your chickens and that your puppy was chasing bok choy. I also wanted to ask if you would put me on your list to volunteer one night. Thanks again, Katie. P.S. It was really special to us that you remembered our name. It is so awesome knowing and being known by your farmers. We are so happy to be a part of this CSA again. Isn't that powerful? Yeah, so the Minnings, Katie, was a member of our CSA for a while. Then they stepped away because she had a some she had a baby. And now they're back. And you can hear in her language that The reason she's a part of our farm is not just because she likes our vegetables. I know that's a big reason. But to her, she wants her kids to learn the story of food. She wants her kids to have the experience of coming out to the farm and having that life out in nature. She loves the fact that her farmer knows her by name. Right? These are all expectations that she was bringing to the table and maybe didn't even realize it. And they're happening. And she's feeling fed by that. And she's letting me know, thank you for giving me this chance to to meet this deeper need. So going to a farm to volunteer, it's more than just, you know, coming out to the farm (laughs) and doing some work for you. There is some deep, powerful stuff that's happening inside of your volunteers. So let's not miss that opportunity. Uh, Tip number five, let's move on. Make sure that your volunteers have the right tools to do the job that you're asking them to do. Now, this may seem obvious, but you would be surprised how often people ask volunteers to come to an event and the volunteers show up and they are completely unprepared. I used to be a youth minister at a church, and so I was very, very particular about this. I used volunteers a lot to run our ministry for our students, and there's no way that I could have done it all by myself if I wanted to scale and grow it, and I knew that. And I learned the hard way by inviting people to come out and volunteer for me at different events, and they would show up, and I didn't have the materials or supplies ready, and they would they would be expecting it all to be there for them, and I'd have to rush around, and I looked disorganized. I could tell they were frustrated, and guess what? They didn't want to come back and volunteer for me again because I didn't take care of them. So when you have a volunteer show up for a farm, don't be running around trying to find all the tools after they've come. Don't waste their time. Their time is valuable. So when you've got all the supplies ready, you've got the crates there and the hoe or whatever they might need to go out into the field, and you've got it all there, that shows them that you have honored their time, you have prepared everything, and you have set them up for success. Okay, so really think about that before you've got 20 people showing up. Do you have 20 kitchen shears so they can all cut garlic or cut the garlic scapes? If you don't, then you need to tell them, bring kitchen shears, which is what we did because we didn't know how many were going to show up and we only had so many snippers. Okay, so think that through. Make sure that you have given them all the tools they need to be successful. All right, tip number six, reward them. Reward them at the end. Um, But maybe they are leaving halfway through because their hour-long shift is done and it's time for them to go. Make sure you have a process, a workflow in place that can walk them out, say thank you, and offer them some kind of freebie. So in our case, we let them take a bunch of garlic scapes home as our thank you. And we have this freezer that is permanently stocked with awesome, awesome ice creams. And we said, hey, I know it was hot outside. Why don't you guys reward yourself? Grab an ice cream of your choice on your way out. Goes a long way when you appreciate your volunteers. Again, back when I was working in the church, this is stuff I would learn when I would go to trainings on how to be a great volunteer organizer. You've got to equip your volunteers and you've got to appreciate your volunteers. You need to have a process for both of those things if you want to have the customer service experience be a positive one. It doesn't have to be a big deal. It can just be a small thing. And, you know, many of them aren't expecting to walk away with something. But if you give them something small, it's just an extra touch, right? It makes them feel really special. 
All right, and the final tip is to document their volunteer experience and share it. So I was taking photographs during this volunteer day. Anytime there was a new wave of volunteers that came in, I was out there snapping photos from so many different angles. I had way more pictures than I really needed, but I wanted to capture the story and I wanted every volunteer to be in at least one photograph. And the reason why I wanted to do this is because I knew I would use this content later in lots of different ways to promote this event and to narrate what had happened. So yes, I'm going to use these pictures, create a collage and put them into my CSA newsletter. This would be a great topic to talk about in my weekly newsletter and say, this is what we did. This is how our community came together to help the farmer. It's a great example of what community supported agriculture is all about. But it's not just the newsletter. I want to post these images on social and my Instagram story. Wherever I can think of posting, I'm trying to tell this story. And this is why this is important. Your customers like seeing themselves on social media. That's a way of you affirming what they did. It's a way of saying thank you. But it does something else. It also shows the world, it shows your community, your CSA community members, what the ultimate CSA member looks like, right? It's almost like it casts vision for what our community of CSA members can be. So imagine you're a brand new CSA rookie member and you didn't come to this event, but you see all this energy and momentum around the volunteer garlic scaping. And you see these people who looked like they were having a fabulous time because they're all laughing together. And there's groups of them in the picture, right? Having community together. And then the language of the post is written in such a way that it celebrates that kind of value-driven community. You're gonna think in your mind, wow, that looks really fun. And there's gonna be some small part of your subconscious that's gonna make a little note and say, that is the destination. That is what I want to become someday if I stick with the CSA. So you are casting vision for your current CSA members who didn't come to the event of like, hey, this is what we stand for. And this is what it means to be a member. So really, really important that you document the story for the sake of not just appreciating those who came, but also for showing people what they could still become. And it gives them something to reach for and move towards. All right. Well, those are my seven tips for putting together a really great volunteer event. My challenge to you is to come up with an event that you can invite your CSA members to participate in. And communicate it with them. So you might be wondering, how did I do that? Well, usually I have a couple of events a year that I know I'm going to need members for. So we've already kind of mapped out that we want them to show up for the great garlic harvest when we actually pull the garlic out and lay them out onto the trailers and bring them inside and start to hang them or cure them. We're going to need help with that, and we know that our members enjoy that. So that is something that's been put on the calendar, like we have a rough weekend where we think it's going to happen, and we've told our members that it's coming. Um, but then there are some events like the garlic scaping where it just spontaneously happened, right? We're going to do a um, another event this weekend um, that I'm going to have to suddenly promote. Either way, whether it's spontaneous or well thought out in advance, here are some of the things that you want to communicate with your members as you promote it, okay? They need to know a few key pieces of information to decide if they want to come or not. Number one, they need to know the date and the time. (laughs) And the earlier that you can tell them this, the better. I also think that there are ideal times when a volunteer is more likely to say yes. So weekends, obviously, are going to be better for your customers. More of them are going to be able to come out on a Saturday and make that like a family morning event or a family outing than if you said, I need you to come out at four o'clock on Thursday. Um, You might have more success with an evening shift for people who are working than you would a morning shift on Monday morning. So just be thinking about what time of the of the week, what time of the day am I doing this? Also, like how hot is it outside? that kind of stuff as well. But tell them when it is, as soon as you possibly can. Uh, Tell them what to wear. So are they going to need to wear rain boots? Is it really muddy out there? Are they going to need to wear sunscreen? Should they wear a hat? Um, Give them some recommendations. Do they need to bring gloves, etc.? 
tell them what to bring. Okay, so we always tell people bring sunscreen and bring water. And we tell them how long we think it will take. So we'll give them a span and say, hey, we're doing this from nine to noon. And we would love it if you could come for an hour, right? Or we would love it if you could come for half the time. Or sometimes we even have shifts where we will create a Google Doc and or a Google Sheet and we'll send the link to them and they can go and literally book their time and say, we're going to be here on this day. That's what we did with our asparagus planting day. We gave people the chance to actually tell us um, when they were going to come because we needed about four people for each hour long shift and we didn't want them all coming in the first hour. Okay, so communicate with them those details. Those are kind of the key points. And sometimes you can get it out in an email. Sometimes you can throw it in your newsletter. Sometimes you can throw it in an Instagram story or just a Facebook Live. Just put it out there into the world. So that's my challenge to you. Come up with a fun event and put it out there into the world. See if your members will come. And when they do, I want you to spend time with them. I want you to see it as an opportunity to connect with them and build a relationship of trust. You guys, volunteer events are a little bit of work. Sometimes they stress me out, but I'm always, always glad after I've done them because I feel so filled up inside. It's a chance for me to connect with my family (laughs) and to just build these deep connections. And when I see the kids come out, like these little kids, and I see them light up by being out here on my farm, like that does something for my soul. So it's It's a really positive experience, not just for your customers, but it can be really positive for you. All right, my friends, that's all I got today. Thanks for joining me. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button and tell your friends about the podcast. I would love to see you back next week for another episode. Take care. Bye-bye. 